At the T-minus three-minute mark, tape recorders on board the spacecraft were turned on. These recorders record both voice and data. This is WOMMLP operating out of Burlington, Vermont, 105.9 The Radiator. It's the Rocket Shop. I'm your host, Tom Proctor. And with me tonight is Aaron Bedrosian. Hello. Hey. I got your second name right. I well, didn't mispronounce it at all, did I? I think you were good, Aaron. I'm good? Yep. Excellent. Um, well, I'm really keen to hear you play. Uh, we usually kick it off with a song. So what have you got for us? Uh, this is Weightless from my second album, A Dark Light. Sweet. Well, uh, please take it away. Okay. Thank you. Weightless that by Aaron Bedrosi, and that was incredible. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, that um, just I, I've never seen really a bass played in the, this manner that you just played that. So uh, yeah, that was quite quite the experience. Oh, I really appreciate that. Um, yeah, so uh, you're very obviously very well known in bass circles. Um, seen a few few reviews written about you in various magazines. Um, you've worked with some incredible. Uh, musicians as well um but tell us first a little bit about your background kind of where you're from and and when did you first start picking this up and realizing you had an incredible talent for it yeah so actually i was born in burlington vermont 
Uh, my father was from Armenia. My mother was from sort of rural Vermont and uh, grew up a very normal kind of Vermont life. And then when I was 12 or 13, one of my friends wanted to start a band and was like, Aram, why don't you play bass? And so that was how that started. And of course, at that time, I was still basically a child. So they, my parents bought me a really used junky thing, but I loved it. It had stickers and BB holes and it was just trashed, but it was great. 50 bucks. And I'm left-handed, uh, but it was a right-handed bass. So I play right-handed because that's how I learned. Um, and then, you know, it just felt so good to me right away. I just connected with the instrument fast. I loved being in the band with my friends. And then um, just sort of at the time, the bass guitar was really exploding in a lot of directions. This was like Primus and, and Flea and Red Hot Chili Peppers. These things were really on the forefront of music and making their way into popular music. And MTV was, was playing this stuff. So, you know, like the album Frizzle Fry by Primus was just like when I was young, I... It was like my life goal to learn how to play those songs. And so I spent a lot of time woodshedding and just playing. And and just uh, over the course of high school, um, I was in a band that I loved. And uh, that's really how I learned how to play. And then in college, I played a lot of gigs um, with a lot of people. I was lucky enough to do that. And so I was self-taught self for a long time, which is, I think, it allowed me to sort of learn some free approaches to technique. Uh, and then in college, I studied like classical theory and jazz improvisation and stuff, but I had already sort of gone wild in my head in terms of the creativity. So I'd always tinkered uh, with solo stuff because when you practice, you're usually alone. But it's funny because now what I'm best known for is definitely the solo material. And people ask me, they're like, well, have you ever played in a band? And it's like, well, yeah, the first 20 <laughs> years I played, that's all I did. Um, but I, uh, I actually hurt my hand like 15 years ago and I was like, well, if my hand recovers, I'm going to make an album of my own because I hadn't done that. Mm -hmm. And it just so happened that the bass is the musical tool that I'm most comfortable with. So it ended up being a solo album, really not necessarily on purpose, but I loved the challenge of trying to make an album. And I'm definitely not the, there, a lot of people have made solo bass music. Well, not a lot, but <laughs> certainly I wasn't the first. And th there are a lot of wonderful, um, artists who did this before me but uh yeah i just wanted to make something that was functional as a musical album that someone who didn't play bass could could listen to so i worked really hard on that first album and was lucky enough to get some great reviews and uh was putting out videos at the same time when youtube was growing so i got some attention that way and at this point i i worked a long time on my second album and uh, had a really nice bass made. And I've been at this point, I've been so fortunate and I've connected with so many people through the music. And I I get incredible feedback all over the place um, from players and non-players alike. So it's it's been an incredible ride. And then you sort of, yeah, you look up and you remember that 12 year old kid who was dreaming of learning how to play Stone Cold Bush, you know, and then then it's like, oh, wow. I learned how to do that at some point. So um, anyway, that's a little bit of the story. Yeah. Uh, do you still have the bass? The $50 <laughs> no. BB? Oh, I wish I color. did. <laughs> I totally, I had to sell it because yeah. it was like at the time when it was time to upgrade, I didn't have the money to just keep the old one. And it was, I didn't realize, yeah, that it would be, I wish I had, but I do still have my first amp. Oh, nice. Yeah. That my parents bought me when I was 12. That day I started playing in a store in the Burlington Square Mall. It was called back then. So. Anyway, it's kind of cool. Well, I'm glad you still got the amp, even not got the bass. Um, yeah, you mentioned a little bit about your first album there. Um, and that really kind of launched into the stratosphere, from what I understand, yeah. in terms of being able to connect with the, these kind of international musicians, uh, you know, household names. Uh, so tell me a little bit about the reception and your for that uh, from that album. And what were your expectations about this album going into it? Did you expect the kind of outcome that you ended up receiving? No, not really. I, uh, I was trying to focus on the craft of the songs and trying to, I was just thinking about making something that I would be proud of at the end of my life or down the road. So I, I wasn't really thinking about the reception. I mean, of course you hope that the music connects because it's a form of communication and you're trying to speak with the, I mean, to me, the notes are words and, you know, you say things and, uh, you say things cause you have to say them. Um, and then when it resonates with other human beings, it's just miraculous. So when the first album was received as well as it was, and I was getting these reviews and I was hearing from these people, um, 
it was extremely humbling. It was, it was, it was something. Yeah. And um, yeah, so let as the audience uh, know who have you played with um, that you may, they may have heard of, and the, you find the best people that you've played with. You know who who really have stuck out for you. Yeah. Well, um, I was lucky enough, and I'm still sort of quasi in a band with John Fishman from Fish, and that was incredible because I grew up listening to that band, and. Um, Gordon Stone, who actually just tragically passed away very recently, was a banjo player who was very well known. And he was sort of the first gig that I um, had as sort of a side man that was really kind of took me out and took me on tour. Uh, and then I've done tons of shows with folks like Buckethead and and just a lot of people that I've sort of shared evenings with that have been incredible. And it, it's all kind of a blur. <laughs> but uh yeah, just very, very fortunate to um, have connected with all, and a lot of people like big figures in the bass world that mm. I've met and I've played with at this point. So um, it's 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 been something. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, on that kind of like level, um, especially because you, you still have regular contact with John Fishman, uh, we've been talking to a lot of local musicians about how badly COVID have, has affected um, it's local music, you know, it's just really difficult to go out and be able to see a band. You might be able to see one outside. It's going to be way harder in the winter. How's this, how, what's the effect that's happening on a, on a kind of a bit of a higher level on a bit of like a touring band kind of level? Do you know at all? Yeah. I mean, I think it's, um, well, it's obviously put everything on hold and it's, it's affected a lot of the, you know, everybody sort of sees the top surface, the musicians themselves and the bands, but there's a whole infrastructure of course of, of, technicians and roadies who've been affected and everybody's really itching to get out, back out on the road. And, um, it's, it's an interesting time because music is such a powerful tool for healing that of course it's, it's persevered and people are finding ways to play and finding ways to listen, but there is no substitute for really being in the same room with people and feeling that energy and telling that story in person, speaking to people in the room through the instruments and, and through the music. And so, um, I think it's uh, it's one it's it's been one of these things that brings out some tough elements of people, but also the best in in people. And and the power of music is as important as it's ever been, if not more important. Right, for sure. And there's obviously ways that that people have been trying to get around this, and there's been like car shows and yeah. All the, but I guess it's kind of not quite the same as getting inside a sweaty room and kind of no. jamming out. It's true, but you know, it's funny too because like streaming is so big now and a lot of my audience, a lot of my audience are far away. Like mm -hmm. I hear from people all over the place. I think perhaps because of the instrumental nature, the instrumental music um, opens itself up in perhaps a way that that music in one particular language doesn't. But uh, it's sort of been nice to kind of be like, okay, well now it's really time to get this. So I've been like getting my my sort of ability to stream refined and all this and, and really been able to connect with people. Uh, so trying to make the most of it, but yeah, there's no substitute for, for playing a real, you know, an in-person show, but uh, we do what we can, you know? And uh, I think it's a beautiful thing that we're able to, to connect through the internet. I mean, if this had happened 30, 40 years ago, 20 years ago, even 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, so l luckily we're able to, um, to do what we can, but uh, yeah. Has it helped you in terms of, um, you know, being able to kind of unplug and get away and and work on your own music? Yes, very much so. Because actually, um, I have a whole like music collective that I started that has become thankfully very busy, which is a good problem. But it, that sort of, of course, like everything else, had to take a pause. And I'm working very hard on my third album. Uh, and so it's been tough to balance it all. Uh, but really... And the nature of what I do, yeah, it, it sort of forced me slash allowed me to really dig into the writing process in a new way, in a in a deeper way. So I'm trying to make the most of it. You know, it's a tough situation, but I'm essentially still that kid who just likes playing bass in a room. I mean, I, <laughs> I've played a lot of, I love playing shows and I love all that, but I'm happy to just work on the craft of, of the songs and try to tap into things like that. So uh, I, yeah, I've been lucky. Oh, fantastic. Well, I'm glad you, you're getting something out of it, uh, even if we've got uh, you know hard times ahead for a lot of people. I do feel like there's a lot of great music coming out because of it, and uh, selfishly, <laughs> yes. I, get, I get to just experience the end products of this. Um, well, we'd love to hear another song. 
Um, so is this going to be from the second album as well? This is actually going to be the title track of the new album. Oh, fantastic. So, which is called Rebirth. So, uh, yeah, I've been tinkering with non-solo arrangements. And so this is actually going to, 90% sure this is going to be a full band track. All right. Rebirth there by Aaron Bedrosian. Um, so you're you're speaking before about you know you kind of like locking yourself away in the in the room and and writing out these arrangements yourself. Uh, I I would have no idea where you even start with this. So please take us through a little bit about how how this starts from like concept to final product. Yeah. Um, well, it's it always it's a little different every time. I mean, there are these techniques that um, have a very distinct sort of feel to them. So for example, like the percussive, if you're strumming on a bass, that might sort of inform the, the rhythmic feel. And then once you get that going, you sort of start moving to a beat, then it's sort of like, well, just need some notes of some kind. So, um, it's a very mysterious process. I mean, I, I have a process, but it's like very mood based. And a lot of times the effects that I'm using right now, I'm just using very basic delay effects, um, simple sort of pared down. But if it's a more involved sort of eerie thing, I've had songs where like the creepy reverb has basically sort of written the song. Uh, but really because the, the style and the tonality and the, and the timbre, I guess, uh, of the, genre of solo bass music is odd in and of itself. I try to focus in on really strong, simple melodies. I gravitate towards strong, simple melodies anyway. So long story short, it's like, it's strange enough as it is that you can get away with very traditional sort of chord progressions and stuff. Uh, so I try to always maintain a balance. And I always sort of ask myself, would this melody sound good on a violin? You know, would this beat of whatever it is sound good on a drum so is it catchy you know because it's like i could just slap you could you could just do it an interesting technique over and over again but it just loses its flavor mm -hmm. it's like somebody just spouting fancy words at a dinner and it just doesn't mm -hmm. mean anything unless you're actually saying something actually you mean what you're saying so uh i try to make sure that the melodies mean something to me um and uh usually they go through uh, like a long period of just making sure that they stay catchy. 
Uh, mm-hmm. And then sometimes things happen fast. I mean, my most popular song I wrote really, really fast. It's called A Dark Light, and it sort of went quasi-viral. It, it brought me to a whole new audience and um, wrote it pretty fast, made the video pretty fast. And the album cut is the exact cut from the video I posted on YouTube because I was like, well, I'm not going to do it any better than this. <laughs> so, and the engineer that I mixed the album with was like the track that you recorded was was good enough, like audio. So, uh, but it was a very meaningful, like, song and i thought it was a little too slow to be interesting but i decided to release it anyway it turns out that uh simple melodies that are meaningful uh sometimes resonate with people and so uh, i don't know that's kind yeah of no that's, that was a good answer and yeah, the, from what it sounds like this this second album is going to be as accessible as the first you were saying that you wanted an album a solo album um that wasn't just you know incomprehensible to the non-trained ear is that so the second album kind of follows the same suit? Yeah. So the second album, uh, I actually had a special bass made for the second album to split the strings to be able to mix in a way that would make it sound more full sonically. So I can separate the strings so I can treat the melody. I can mix the melody. The engineer can mix the melody like a vocal mm-hmm. where the lower notes can be mixed. I'm not using that system today and I don't usually use it live at least yet, but um the third album is is pushing its way into band territory, and I've re- I've put out some like full band stuff at this point. I did a live video with a violin player and a hand drummer um, of a composition I wrote a few years ago, and that's been really well received. A family in where were they? Somewhere in Eastern Europe during the um, the quarantine recorded a version of this song as a family, and their little daughter was dancing. It was so beautiful. And they sh- they shared it with me a couple months ago. They wrote to me like four months ago and asked if they could do it. And then I was like, yes, of course. But th- I didn't expect it to be as good as it was. So um, or as touching as it was like they really took a lot of time. So, uh, yeah, pushing my way into full band stuff. And that's sort of along the lines of asking yourself. You have to ask yourself artistically, like, uh, what do I want to say? What do I hear? And so, um most of the stuff I listen to is rock or mm. there's some kind of band involved. Uh, so it's kind of interesting because a lot of times people are like, oh, you must listen to tons of solo music. And I actually don't. <laughs> um, but I appreciate it, of course. And uh, so, yeah, it's been fun to try to expand it. So cl- to clarify, so uh, you've got two albums out and the third one is due to be released or are you still in the process of making it? Yes, it's due to be released. I'm in the process of making it as fast as I can, <laughs> but I'm a perfectionist to some degree. So I'm really trying to at least, I may release it as an EP in two or three months mm-hmm. um, and split it into maybe a solo because there are solo pieces I definitely want to put out on it. And then there's some band pieces. So it may get split into two things, but it's it's upcoming, yeah. So I have two that are available all over the place, iTunes, Spotify, and my website. And then the third uh, is is due out. And you said the third, so the first two are pure solo. Pure and solo. The third one, you started introducing a band. So tell me a little bit about the band. Uh, is it is it different for every single track, or have you got like a, a set set people who you keep going back to? Uh, well, it's been interesting. I haven't set yeah it's so far it's different people on different tracks uh there's one track i have uh called haunted and there was there's a i think they're actually kind of broke up at this point but there was a band called necromancer based Mm -hmm. in the burlington area or in vermont and they were sort of a edm kind of goth and i loved the way they sounded so i approached uh the drummer and the and the one of the synth players and um asked if they wanted to do this track with me and i really loved and we started to work on it so i love how that's coming out it's kind of like a dark uh brooding kind of i don't want to say dancey but very heavy Mm -hmm. um kind of thing and so those are a couple people i'm working with and then there's other people uh i'm sort of seeing what the vibe is at the moment but nothing's set right now Mm -hmm. so yeah that's a big part of the process so if it clicks it'll make things go a lot faster So uh, what have you learned from like your first and second album that you're that you're bringing into your third album and what you what are you changing apart from obviously bringing a band into it, which I'm assuming is a pretty major change for you? Well, yeah, and I've recorded with bands a lot in the past, um, but I think the experience of making the first two albums uh, especially the second album, which was, te- it took me 10 years to make that album. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, because I wrote this song, A Dark Light, and 
it was so well received and and I was kind of like, wow, how did it come out that well? Cause I wrote it really fast and I released it. Um, but, um, then I was like, well, I better write nine more songs that are just as good or at least my very best effort. And I did, and it took me that long. <laughs> and so, uh, what I, the thing is, as an artist, you, there's the, the minutia of getting into every single detail. And then there's just the ability to produce work and it doesn't take you 10 years. Like I'm determined not to take 10 years on this album. So yeah, you, I'm trying to sort of, because a lot of times too, the raw energy of something a little more rough, it, it has a really nice quality. So you don't want to over polish things. I and mean, I feel like it's, it's like saying something important and you practice what you're going to say to somebody you love, but you don't want to over practice it, mm -hmm. but you want to like take a day right. to be like, is this what I really want to say? But if you take four days, you're going to lose what it was you were even mm. trying to say. So just, yeah, the experience of, of honing in the right amount, not mm -hmm. too much. Um, well, I would love to hear another song. Um, which album is this from? Uh, I guess I'll just play A Dark Light, which is the title track of my second album. Nice. <laughs> Like there by Aaron Bedrosian, and um, I wanted to kind of switch gears a little bit now and talk a little bit about Burlington Music Dojo. Sure, because you founded that place, and I did. Yeah, it's, that's pretty incredible. It's, I mean, that's a pretty um, uh, famous place around Burlington for musicians. A lot of great uh, artists play there. So, could you tell me a little bit about the history and how it how it got started and how it progressed? Sure. Yeah, I. Uh I've been teaching uh, for a long time. I love teaching. My mother was a teacher. So I've been instructing the bass uh, 
since I, I was on the road for a long time, and when I got off the road, like a lot of musicians, it was sort of like, ah, oh, maybe I'll try giving lessons. And so found that I really enjoyed it. And so was teaching at local music stores. Uh, and then I was sort of out on my own in the corner of a painting studio, actually in this building, hmm. <laughs> which is really, really funny. Um, but uh, then eventually I was sort of like, well, it would be really nice to have a place where other independent instructors could get together where it would sort of be a hub for music instruction and a place where bands could rehearse. And so just a flexible music center for the community. Uh, and I really, I'm much more of a bass player than I am a business person. <laughs> so I had to go through the nuts and bolts of like, well, how do you start a business? Yeah. Um, of course I like, am sort of self-employed through all my music and this, that, and the other, but, uh, hadn't really started a business like that. So, Got it started, had some great musicians. The first roster of the dojo had some other, like Russ Lawton, who I'd played with, who's a fantastic drummer. He's in Trey Anastasio's band, and, and Bob Wagner, who plays with everybody. We had a really cool uh, group of musicians, and everybody's schedules and people come and go from the dojo. Uh, but over the years, it's like evolved and grown. And then actually, uh, one of the students who had a business background was so interested in the place that he, we, after talking a long time, he became my partner in the business. And that was amazing because that boosted us up in several ways. And so over the years, it's just grown mostly word of mouth. And um, COVID, of course, like that was tough because mm -hmm. in-person lessons for voice, everything stopped everywhere for a couple months. But, mm -hmm. but even now we're returning with safety measures and shields. Uh, and I'm very lucky cause I've been giving remote lessons for many years, mm -hmm. uh, to people who've sort of found me through YouTube and found me. So, so the transition to, to go to remote was, was pretty easy for me, but, uh, yeah, the dojo's back and growing and we just in partnership with the local nonprofit, uh, the friends for a dog foundation, we were awarded this huge grant, um, uh, to give underprivileged children, uh, music lessons, which is incredible. So that was in a huge beautiful thing to be able to um we're going to be able to help four or five kids a year for four years get lessons who might otherwise not be able to do it and so yeah the dojo has been incredible and it's sort of it's i keep it somewhat separate from my music uh but i i love it a lot of musicians uh don't teach and a lot of teachers don't play music mm -hmm. and it's sort of you have to have the components of a teacher and of course you have to be knowledgeable about your instrument but you have to be patient and enjoy. And it's funny too, because a lot of times people, especially if they hear my solo work and a lot of times people will say, well, I didn't think you'd want a beginner, you know? And I'm like, of course I do. I love, I love teaching beginners. Uh, and so I enjoy the process of sharing that and seeing someone, because when I was a kid, I was a little bit lost when I started mm -hmm. to play the bass. Uh, and I've never lost the appreciation for, uh, what it can do and what it can mean to connect with other people in a band like that, but also to find your voice like that. And so uh, I firmly believe that it, a lot of times it's the quiet person in the room and maybe the quiet kid who seems a little shy that often has something incredible to say. And so that spirit is at the heart of the dojo. And and I've been lucky enough to work with all these other wonderful instructors there now. And and it's grown into this beautiful thing and it's continuing to grow. And COVID has, has forced us to evolve a little bit, but... Um, it's good. We're marching on and we're still growing. And uh, so that's that. Yeah. And I'm um, so glad it's there. I'm so glad it's kind of part of this whole complex. And uh, yeah, I've heard only good things. Is there any people in the in the years that you've taught that really shone for you? Any kind of a memorable, uh, a memorable person that's come kind of through the dojo? A lot of memorable people have come through the dojo. Uh, it's tough to single anybody out. Um, touring musicians. <sighs> no, I'm just going to say everybody. No, right. Yeah. Sorry. Like a, like I'm kind of drawing a blank because it's just a collage yeah. of incredible memories. So I, it's, yeah. Like a proud father, you know, you don't have one favorite child. You, all yeah. of them are your favorite. <laughs> yeah. And then, of course, uh, yeah, there are students who go on. I've had a lot of students go on to become professional musicians. Um, and that's always a beautiful thing. Mm. And then you have students who are gifted with perfect pitch. But then you also have those students who just dig in their heels and they just make the best of, of it. And it means a lot to them. And those are just as gratifying. So it's it's all good yeah. to me. 
Um, and finally, I want to ask you a little bit about the guitar, because ah, I know yeah. it's quite a special piece of equipment. Would you like to tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, so this was a... Uh... This is a cool story. This was made by this German luthier named Jens Ritter, who, since I've known him, has become very famous. I think I think he has a bass in the Smithsonian. Oh, wow. A, a bass he made for Phil Lesh from The Grateful Dead. And that's a cool story, too, because I was there when Phil Lesh ordered that bass. And then I played that bass the following year in California before he got it. I put strings on it. My friend was like, do you mind putting strings on this? I have to deliver it to Phil. You know, but anyway. Um, yeah, this bass is very special. My... This is my second Ritter bass. The first one I got, on, I was lucky enough to find on eBay. And then I wrote to him. We became friends. I put out my first album. And that was one of the nicest connections I made through my first album was uh, the strong connection with him. And I think the solo work features the sound of the instruments in a in a way he really appreciates. And so uh, we became good friends and he, he likes what I do. So this uh, was custom made for me. And it's just very special. It's just got a bunch of sick features. And really, I got this in 2008, and it's had numerous modifications over the years. And this is, I'm proud to say this is its final Final state. form? Yeah. <laughs> I can't really ask for anything else now. It's It plays so nice. And it's kind of like, I can pick up a $100 bass and just have a wonderful time. But I have been playing long enough now to appreciate how unbelievably nice this one is. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it can split the strings, which is a very unusual feature. But for what I do, it's actually really cool. And it's, uh, it's just got, yeah, it's like one piece of burl maple. And it's just got gold frets. And this inlay, a friend of mine, my designer designed this inlay with the golden ratio mm -hmm. and my logo. And it's just like, it's a little over the top, but whatever. You only live once. Hey, I mean, this is literally your profession. I feel like yeah. you, if you're going to splurge on anything... This is a good thing to splurge on. Yeah. Um, did you get pick the maple because of the Vermont connection, or was that just a happy coincidence? Which connection, sir? The, the fact you picked a maple. Uh, was that because Vermont? Or oh, Vermont, yeah. A little bit. But actually, the first one of these I had was maple mm. that I got on eBay. And originally, I was like, well, I just like another one just like this. But being the artist that he is, and I visited his shop uh in Germany, I was finally able to go hang out with him at his shop in Germany. He had like, he's crazy. He has like bodies dipped in wine and aged in wine. And he has like one covered in crystals that Lady Gaga owns one of the five. And he's just, it was a wild time to visit him. But um, being the artist that he is, he he wanted to do something different with this one. And I I was like, yeah, I mean, do what you do. What you do. So it, um, the first incarnation was really, really nice. And a lot of the recordings on a dark light are from that first, you know, 1.0 version of this bass. And then some of the other recordings are with the 2.0 version of this bass uh, on a dark light. So now it's, it's, yeah, I, mean, I don't know what to say. It feels incredible. I, I don't own a, you know, a McLaren car or a Bugatti. Mm -hmm. But if I did, I would imagine this is what it feels like. Yeah. It's a very special instrument. And he puts a lot of love into what he does. And it's a it's a beautiful friendship we have. And I'm uh, happy to play this bass. So is it, do you feel like this is the final bass you'll ever have? Or is this, or is this well, the, just the, the best bass? Well, it's the ever final bass I'll ever need. <laughs> I don't know if it's the final bass I'll ever have. Uh, but um, I'm a four string. I had a six string bass in, in high school, uh, which is just bigger. And I just a lot of a lot of bass players ask me, you know, would you like more strings? How come you don't play a five string or a six string? And they get wild now. You can get up to like twelve strings. They mm -hmm. look like yeah, a I've, gag. I've seen them, they look ridiculous. Yes, <laughs> and I've played them, and they're uh, and I I think this is an art, and whatever anybody, whatever allows someone to say what they want to say is is exactly what they like, what they should have. But I uh, I'm just I don't know. I like trying to do what I do with a four string. It forces me to yield. Like harmonics, like I have to work to get mm. notes higher than this. And if I want to go lower, so I do some altered tunings and I do a lot of harmonics. I I, I try to harvest as much sound out of this. Uh, somebody once, I mean, a lot of people have said that the limitations set you free. Mm -hmm. And so within these limitations, I feel completely free. It's nice. Nice. Oh, well, we've got about time for one more song. Um, what have you got for us? Ah, uh, let's see. I think I'll play. This is a song from my second album, A Dark Light, called Almost Home.
Almost Home by Aaron Bedrosian. Thank you so much for coming in this evening. Really, really love this. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. No, not at all. Um, join us next week um, at the same time, same place, 105.9 The Radiator, um, for Modest. Um, but that's all for tonight. This has been The Rocket Shop. I've been your host, Tom Proctor. Good night. <laughs>